Okay, let's get started. In 1987, there was a fight between the broker-dealer Shearson and its customer, the McMahons. The McMahons wanted to have their fraud claims brought under the 34 Act against Shearson heard in court. Not unreasonable. However, Shearson pointed out that the McMahons had signed a pre-dispute agreement require them, requiring them to arbitrate all disputes arising out of their relationship in arbitration. Furthermore, they pointed out that the Federal Arbitration Act required the agreement to arbitrate to be upheld like any other contract. The McMahons countered that forcing them to arbitrate their claims violated, among other things, the anti-waiver provisions of the 34 Act, meaning you can't waive any of the protections that the 34 Act gives customers. In a five to four landmark decision, Shearson American Express versus McMahon, the Supreme Court dramatically changed the dispute resolution landscape between customer and broker dealer. The McMahon Court held that requiring the arbitration of customer claims did not violate or waive any of the protections provided by the 34 Act. And it agreed that the Federal Arbitration Act required the arbitration agreement between the parties to be upheld. And it further reasoned that the McMahons were not being forced to waive any of the rights that they had under the 34 Act. Those rights were simply being heard and determined in another forum, arbitration. It's really not as simple, however, as substituting one forum for another. The arbitration forum the McMahons were referred to was administered by the securities industry. And there was no constitutional right to a jury trial or to full discovery, to a reasoned decision, or to an appeal process where errors of law could be corrected. None of these rights existed in arbitration. This evening, we have the two lawyers who argued this landmark decision. Ted Kredzak for Shearson American Express and Ted Eppenstein for the McMahons. We also have in the audience our own professor, Jim Fanto, right here in the front row. And the interesting thing is that Professor Fanto was clerking for Justice Blackman when McMahon was decided. Interestingly, Justice Blackman wrote the dissenting opinion for three of the justices. And we look forward to Jim's comments here today. I should also point out that sitting next to him is our own Roberta Carmel, Professor Carmel, who is a former SEC commissioner. We're happy to have them here tonight. We're also fortunate to have with us tonight George Friedman. George is the Director of Dispute Resolution at FINRA. How many people know what FINRA is? Yeah, okay. Okay, FINRA is the uh, self-regulatory organization to which all broker-dealers must belong and it provides the arbitration forum for the disputing parties. We're also fortunate to have Bob Davidson here. Bob is the executive director of JAMS Arbitration Practice, a highly regarded private dispute resolution forum provider whose roster of arbitrators includes many, many former federal and state court judges and magistrates. We're not here tonight to relitigate the McMahon case. The court found that the statutory claims brought by the customer could be heard and determined in arbitration. What we're here tonight to discuss is, is it fair to force customers to arbitrate disputes uh, with their broker dealer? Or put another way, are mandatory pre-dispute securities arbitration agreements in the public's in interest? 
This is the question that the Obama administration's 2009 white paper urged the SEC to study. And it's the question that informs the House's Investor Protection Act of 2009 and the Senate's Arbitration Fairness Act of 2009. So let me just throw out some observations to get this started. For one thing, I don't know of any broker-dealer that doesn't include a mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clause in its customer agreements that would require arbitration of all the disputes that arise out of or pertain to the relationship. Most would not only see that as a contract of adhesion, but would it also acknowledge that as a practical matter, individuals who don't want to agree to arbitrate their disputes are going to be precluded from accessing the markets. That's kind of a big deal. But our focus tonight is not on arbitration as a poor or inadequate dispute resolution mechanism, which it is not. Our focus is on fairness and the public interest, the right to choose either court or arbitration. The question is, what's wrong with giving the customer her choice of court or arbitration at FINRA or JAMS? for that matter. George Friedman, you want to take that question? The question of choice is the question of the day, and that is, th that is where this is going to land, and really focuses on whether an investor... Do you hear him? Uh, and that concludes my remarks. Any questions? <laughs> uh, the, uh, no, the question of, question of cho uh, choice and fairness is, is, is really the issue of the day, and just to I am a law professor, adjunct professor at Fordham, so to set the stage here, you know, we have the Federal Arbitration Act that says uh, future dispute arbitration agreements are okay. We also have a couple of Supreme Court decisions, these guys, you know, created one of them, that say uh, future disputes uh, arbitration agreements in the securities world are okay. So uh, our view, FINRA's view uh, on the current legislation, uh, specifically on whether investors should have a choice of arbit uh, being required to arbitrate as a condition of doing business is, look, you've got the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, allows arbitration, you've got Supreme Court decisions. If you're going to change it, it's going to require an act of Congress or at least authorization to the SEC to regulate in this area. Want to do that, go ahead. I mean, fin FINRA's view is it doesn't have a horse in that race on mandatory. We do have strong feelings, however, uh, about when firms use arbitration agreements, and if they do, we have rules that govern the content and placement of the clauses. So, for example, and the clause can't be buried in small print somewhere in the contract. There's got to be clear notice. Um, and last, we have a rule that says arbitration clause or not, if the customer wants to arbitrate a dispute at any point, the firm has to, and, and our view is that rule has to remain. Uh, no matter what happens in Congress, the investor should always have the right to do that. Okay. So then why isn't this just a simple question? Why, why does the SEC even need to study this question of whether or not customers ought to have choice? In fact, no. <laughs> I'll be here all night. It's okay. <laughs> um, in fact, before McMahon had Krebs back, wasn't it true that the SEC tried to make sure that customers knew that they could opt out of arbitration and choose court. So why are we still talking about this? Yes, it's amazing we're still talking about the same thing 25 years later. Um, in, in 1987, when we did the McMahon case, there was a rule that the SEC had. It was Rule 15C2-2. It's yes. amazing I can still remember that. <laughs> um, in which you had to, the brokerage firms had to put in their arbitration clause a provision that we understand that we do not have to arbitrate federal securities law disputes. And why did they do that? Because of the Wilco v. Swan decision from 1953, which Professor Fanto is very familiar with, um, which said you cannot arbitrate, um, you cannot require pre-dispute arbitration of claims under the 33 Act. And as we didn't find out until the McMahon case later on, the Wilco Court really based that on their belief that arbitration was sort of an unfounded forum, untested forum. They weren't sure that people's rights would be vindicated in that forum. And I think most importantly, back in 1953, the SEC did not have oversight 
over the arbitration, securities arbitration rulemaking process, which it did later on. So by the time McMahon came around and then the, the Rodriguez case in 1989, which overturned Wilco, it focused on the fact that, look, Wilco may have been right at the time, but the fact of the matter is now the SEC oversees this process. The SEC is obviously set up to protect investors. It oversees the rules, has to approve all the rules after public hearings and public forum and an opportunity for everybody to be heard. And given, the, given that and given the National Arbitration Act and a national policy favoring arbitration, we feel even though you might argue these are contracts of adhesion, they don't violate public policy because there's a national policy favoring arbitration. So the whole thing sort of turned around in 25 years. Um, but yeah, the SEC originally, I think, filed an amicus brief on behalf of the investor in the Wilco v. Swan case. And then in, what was interesting was in McMahon in 1987, the SEC actually turned around and filed an amicus brief on behalf of Shearson, um, which was an instrumental part in helping us win the case. Well, uh, I think considering the uh, recent financial meltdown, I think the fact that the SEC has oversight capacity and authority is maybe not too much comfort to the investors out there. But um, I think arbitration has come a long way since McMahon. And uh, I know FINRA is constantly trying to be responsive to um, the public, uh, the public's perception and criticism of arbitration. And it's uh, continually perfecting the process and attempting to be responsive. So, Ted Eppenstein, you still want to go to court? No, I'd like to have the, the right to choose. But uh, before I, I expand that, uh, Karen, I'd like to thank Brooklyn Law School for inviting me to, uh, to give my views today and to see uh, my friend Ted Krebsbach again and George and uh, Bob. And I'd like to thank Brooklyn also uh, for giving my wife Madeline and my partner a fine education when she was here as a student. And thanks also for giving her a scholarship for a year. That was very nice of you. <laughs> uh, Ted, before you go on, yes. I do want to acknowledge Madeline Eppenstein, who is a Brooklyn Law School. Not only is she a Brooklyn Law School graduate, but she wrote the uh, brief in the uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Shearson versus McMahon. She's sitting in the front row right there. Right. right. And, and she also is in charge of winding me up and sending me out to argue, which is what she did. <laughs> In this case, um, I, I, would, uh, I would say that um, there were a few things that were commented on before that um, I have a different view about. Uh, one, uh, I'm, I'm glad that my friend Ted uh, remembers Rule 15C2-2 because you certainly didn't remember it too well when we argued the case. And <laughs> the rule was, uh, was uh, devised by the, uh, the SEC. Uh, they uh, first came out with a uh, release back in 1979. Uh, mind you, our case was argued in 87. Uh, talking about um, uh, whether you could have arbitration of uh, statutory rights, which are in the 34 Act. Um, they went on and had another release uh, in uh, 82, as I remember. And in 1983, they came out and promulgated Rule 15C2-2, which they had previously found um, uh, it would be an unfair trade practice if the broker-dealers would give customers an arbitration clause that would contain a clause that would require arbitration of statutory claims. Uh, and that rule was in effect at the time that we argued the McMahon case. And Justice Blackman and Justice Stevens certainly knew about the rule since they played ping pong with the attorney who was testifying for the government uh, at that time. And they asked the attorney, as I remember, a question somewhat to the effect of uh, how did you come to the decision, you being the SEC, that before it was no good and today it's fine. And there was a silence in the courtroom for a number of seconds. And then I believe it was Justice Blackman who helped the attorney out and said, did you see the light? And the attorney said, yeah, I saw the light. I saw the light. And that was the best explanation that the SEC could have in those days, I think, for why they did a flip-flop, turn their back on the rights of the investor, and supported the industry. 
Now, why does the customer want to have the right to choose? Well, that was the right that the customer had going back to Wilco versus Swan, which was a 1953 U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, and customers would exercise when they wanted to their constitutional right under uh, Article 7 uh, to have a trial by judge and jury. Um, they also had the right under the rules of the self-regulatory organizations like the NASD and the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange to arbitrate any dispute that they have with a broker, dealer, member firm. So they had a choice of going to arbitration or going to court. Uh, and we believe that, I won't dominate this conversation, but we, we believe on behalf of the investor that they still should have that choice and, and it should be returned back to them by the Congress uh, because as Justice Blackmun said in his lengthy dissenting opinion in the McMahon case, it is really up to Congress to act to save the investor. Okay. Um, so w would you agree to expanding the choice uh, to going to court? What about uh, expanding the choice to another arbitration forum, like Jams, for example? I think that's my cue, is that? Uh, if you want it to be. Sure. Um, Arbitration is a private process in its essence. Uh, the organizations who do it, uh, primarily in the United States, the American Arbitration Association, and to a lesser extent, uh, JAMS, we had 2,000 case filings last year at JAMS, um, uh, work with arbitrators who charge an hourly rate if they choose to do so, and then they get paid. Uh, because of the, the nature of these claims, as a practical matter, I myself have seen, uh, and I've been a jam since really the beginning of 2004, um, very few uh, securities claims that are traditionally before FINRA, in other words, uh, uh, the customer claims. And I remember when I was chair of the arbitration committee of the New York City Bar, we had George, I think, as a guest, uh, and we, we were, um, asking him to lobby for uh, a higher fee <laughs> for the arbitrators. And uh, I think the answer at that time was that any such rule would have to be uh, uh, vetted and, uh, and put out for comment, and then the SEC would have to approve. And the plaintiff's bar, uh, especially, would be uh, against raising the fees of, of arbitrators. Um, and I suggest that the private provider option, whether it be JAMS or the AAA or anyone else, um, is really not going to solve whatever difficulties might be, uh, might be encountered here. Uh, uh, just as an aside, uh, uh, securities claims are kind of like insurance or banking. There are vast numbers of them. And a lot of people get caught in this net, a lot of people without the uh, uh, resources to fund uh, uh, litigation. And for that reason, I think a FINRA-like mechanism is probably uh, 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 the only practical way to give uh, a litigants a fair day in court. Um, I, I recognize that um, a lot of lawyers would rather be in court, but I personally see this as a desire for uh, uh, a class action status that is not really uh, uh, a friendly in, in an arbitration forum, unlike, unlike in a court. A lot of this is economically driven, um, and you have to ask yourself the ultimate question of should you arbitrate, you go to court, it's, you know, the arbitration fairness, which I'm sure we're going to get to, is if you wipe out arbitration of these types or other types of claims, what's the alternative? It's compared to what? And um, I myself, uh, sitting as a FINRA arbitrator and um, uh, uh, mediating a, a, a number of these cases, uh, have become convinced that uh, 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 a kind of alternate dispute resolution system is the fair way home for the largest number of people who suffer losses because of bad broker behavior or something of that nature. 
So, so you're saying that, uh, you know, as FINRA itself says, that uh, arbitration is faster and less expensive and therefore uh, offers a, a viable option for people who believe they've been uh, harmed by broker misconduct. Let me just say that I think programs like yours, which have cropped up in many law schools. The Investor Rights Clinic? Yeah, I think uh, fulfill a terrific need. And I think with clinics like this and enthusiastic and, and skilled students who are supervised, I think investors are going to get, uh, in my mind, and I used to try cases for a living, I think every bit of the skill level they would get by paying a private attorney, walking into a court, uh, being held up for, for two years, uh, securities firms would probably love a court option. They wouldn't have to deal with a claim for years if they didn't want. It's a, it's a, I, I see my, my brethren uh, moving no, up to the well, mic. So I, 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 I you know, but uh, I, I go back to the, uh, the uh, uh, compared to what question. You want to jump in? I, I wouldn't mind following up on that because I think that's a, a great contrast to make. I mean, let's face it, if the only question here today is should people have choice? I mean, why have a seminar? Of course, everybody always thinks you should have choice. It, it can't be that simple, right? Um, and well, first of all, I would like to say one thing. I, want, I would like to mention I, I had the opportunity to speak to the clinic here uh, yes. and make a presentation five years ago. Right now, we have uh, three of the six <coughs> full-time lawyers in our firm are from Brooklyn Law School, including one person who I met for the first time at that clinic and wound up hiring right out of law school. The only time we've ever done that, and it was one of the best hires we ever had. So. We have three of our people here today. I will not point you out in the audience because she'd be embarrassed. I will. She's right there. <laughs> Kate McGrath. <McGrail. laughs> uh, but these clinics are fantastic experiences for uh, for law students. And uh, how many people in this room are, are in the clinic or have taken the clinic? That's that's good to know. Packs the room. Yeah, all on one side of the room. <laughs> but anyway, to get back to Bob's point. I always like to say, well, what are you comparing arbitration to? Everybody says you lose your right to a jury, you know, you lose your right to appeals, you lose discovery rights, but does anyone really that's practiced in the court system for a long time think that it's a perfect system? I mean, have you ever seen an interview on TV where two people walk out of a, a jury trial and they interview the loser and the, the loser's saying, boy, what a great process that was? I mean, let's face it, I mean, there's good and bad in everything, and we all know that in the court system, especially in the state court system, there's long delays, there's all sorts of ways that you can abuse the process. In fact, think about it. If you're a typical small investor, okay, and you go to court, look at all the tools that a brokerage firm has, okay? First of all, they'll always make the motion to strike your pleading, okay, which costs you a fortune in legal fees, okay? They'll have depositions, they can have all sorts of burdensome interrogatories, they can have the inevitable motions to dismiss on statute of limitations or whatever as motion for summary judgment. If you're fortunate enough ever to get a hearing, okay, you're going to have the inevitable appeal and the thing's going to drag out for years and let's face it, justice delayed is justice denied and we all know the litigation system has a lot of defects. Personally, having been involved in litigation in court and arbitration for 30 years, I am of the personal opinion that most people that are sued in court would be better off flipping a coin on the first day and saving themselves all the legal fees. Because I think you, at the end, between the fees and everything else, you'd probably be better off. That's my own personal opinion. Now, arbitration is a completely different animal, okay? But if you're a small investor and you file an arbitration, you don't even need an attorney, okay? You don't have to have a formal pleading listing all different legal causes of action. All you have to do is file a one-page piece of paper that says, I was wrong, and you file your fee, and you are basically guaranteed your day in court, which is something you're not guaranteed in court. Yeah, but against somebody like me, right? You but have to be on the other side of the fence. FINRA even passed a rule recently which basically prohibited motions to dismiss um, in, in just about any circumstance. So if you file an arbitration, you can file a one-page document. You don't have to get deposed. You're not subject to motions to dismiss. You never, you know, you're going to have a hearing guaranteed. And you're going to have a hearing in front of three people, two of whom are from the public, all of whom have been trained in the process, many of whom have been experienced in seeing good and bad cases and sort of have a context for evaluating your case. 
And the industry person, and this is what, what always cracks me up, you always hear there's an industry arbitrator, therefore it must be stacked deck, right? Well, think about it. What is the most competitive business you know? It's got to be Wall Street. Everybody's, you know, cutthroat. Everybody's trying to get everybody else. Can you imagine making an argument that having a broker from Merrill Lynch on a panel against a broker, a case against a broker from Goldman Sachs, that bro broker from Merrill Lynch is going to go out of his way to help the other guy? If anything, it's going to be just the opposite. And you'll find, if you interview arbitrators, and maybe you, you get a chance to do that as part of your clinic, you'll find out that most arbitrators will tell you it's the securities arbitrator that is toughest on the securities industry because they want the standards to be high, they want to be proud of the industry they're a member of, and if they see a bad actor, they want that person out of the business. So getting back to Bob's point, I think you always have to ask yourself, compared to what? Is arbitration perfect? No. Is litigation perfect? No. They're two entirely different systems. But personally, I think the average person, like Bob said, really is much better off in arbitration. Yeah, I think you've made some excellent points. Uh, and uh, I, e even in my experience as a at FINRA and NASD arbitrator, I would find that the industry person, I don't think I ever sat with an industry person that I felt was biased, and I do believe that they wanted to get the bad apples out. But still, let's get back on track. It's not about, uh, there are two different systems, but it's not about either or, it's why can't there be choice? And I think, Ted Eppenstein, I thought uh, you were chomping at the bit to comment there. I was, you know, um, I'm really happy to be here because otherwise you wouldn't have any public customer representative to talk to you. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm hearing about how We've we're going to be- We've got a lot of students here that represent public customers. Right, but they're not sitting up here and- Oh, okay. They're not being able to comment. Uh, but I'm used to being in the minority in these types of uh, situations. Uh, the, the fact is, I don't think that if you're an investor, you want to be told by someone who represents the industry that you know you're better off going to arbitration than you would in court. Um, it's so great. Uh, if, if you take a look at the way the sides have polarized for over 25 years on this issue, where the investors' attorneys and the investors want to go to court if they have the right to do it and want to go to arbitration if they have the right to do it, depending upon the case. Obviously, we're not trying to wipe out arbitration here. That's not what Congress is looking to do. That's not what the investors want. The investors want the right to go to court in an appropriate case. They also want the right, which is what they had before the McMahon decision, to go to arbitration with an appropriate case. And they want to do it in a way that is cost effective for them and they want to go to a fair forum. Now, there have been a lot of studies on the fairness of arbitration. And as part of the materials that uh, you should find in the handout pamphlet today is an article which Madeline and I wrote, which give you some uh, background into those studies. And uh, the most recent one was actually uh, performed by a group that uh, George uh, and I are uh, members of, and that's called SECA, the Securities Industry Conference of Arbitration. Uh, and uh, the group is a, a very diverse group. There are three public members. Uh, there's the head of arbitration at FINRA. Uh, there is the head of arbitration at the other SROs who are uh, members of, of SECA. Uh, NASA, the North American uh, Securities Arbitra uh, uh, Association, which com uh, comprise all of the um, regulators from every state in the U.S. plus Canada, they have a seat on uh, SECA, um, as does SIFMA, and SIFMA is an organization which uh, represents the broker-dealers in this world. Um, and we commissioned uh, some academics from Cornell University School of Law. Um, uh, and also we commissioned two law professors, uh, Jill Gross and Barbara Black, to do a study on the fairness of arbitration. And they developed 
the study so that the people who went to awards, and this is the participants in the proceedings, namely the customer, the customer's attorney, the brokerage firms, the associated persons, that's a, a catchword for the registered representatives in this world, who um, are uh, registered at FINRA, uh, and their attorneys were all sent surveys. So if there was an award that was issued in 2005 or 2006, every participant got a survey to respond. We got 3,000 people to respond to this survey. And what's the perception? Well, the perception is that half of the people who respond, half of the customers who responded thought that securities arbitration was biased. 62% of the customers thought that the arbitration process itself was unfair. 75% of the customers who had the unfortunate experience of not only, only going to an arbitration uh, case at either the New York Stock Exchange or the NASD, or in addition to that, having a court experience 75% of those customers said that they were treated better in court than they were in arbitration. And that's with all the delays that you've been hearing about for the last 20 minutes. So we don't need any more studies. This is a definitive issue here. It's ripe for Congress. And I can tell you that the industry wants the investor to go to arbitration for several reasons. First of all, there is someone from the industry who sits on every case. And yes, FINRA has started to make some changes in its arbitration system which are more investor friendly. We'll get into those later. One is something called the Public Arbitrator Pilot Program, which is temporary which does not reach the majority of broker-dealers, but just a handful who voluntarily have gone into this program where you can receive arbitrators in a case who are not members of the securities industry. Can we, can we, uh, that's a subject I really want to delve more deeply into, but I see uh, both George and Bob want to respond to, and maybe Ted as well, uh, to this uh, empirical study that was done uh, by a lot of very well-respected uh, people at both Cornell and uh, Pace. And uh, yes, the, the sum and substance of it was that people uh, didn't trust arbitration. Ah, the word he said before, the key word was perception. There have been studies about perceptions and feelings and views. Uh, I'm not sure that, and the data is empirical, but it's, I'm not sure we're talking about absolute data on fairness. And I'm not sure, by the way, if the Supreme Court has to do this, how it's going to do that. I mean, if I'm, this, if, I'm sorry, if the SEC has to uh, decide what fairness is, I'm not sure how they do that. I mean, you look at comparables, there really aren't any comparable court cases that are, are like this. Or you might look at procedures, which the Supreme Court did a couple of times, uh, you know, can can uh, investors effectively get their rights vindicated in the arbitration forum? Uh, do you look at access? How long does it take? Are there motions granted to dismiss if you actually get your day in court? So um, I would agree that there have been studies, the most recent one Ted just mentioned, on perceptions, feelings. And there is a perception problem, I agree. I mean, if you have that, that high a percentage of participants feeling that the system is biased, that's an issue that has to be addressed. And by the way, I think 40% felt that way going in. Um, felt it was unfair. Just yeah, get George, just be before, I'm going to let you continue, but before you continue, I just want to highlight a few things here. And, and I think that this is maybe where the perception uh, emanates from. One, the, the forum is run by FINRA, which is an association that all broker-dealers have to belong to. Number two, uh, a third of the arbitration panel is comprised of somebody from the industry. That's kind of like saying if you have a medical malpractice case, 
you're going to reserve a third of the jury for doctors. Well, we're talking. Wait, wait, we're talking about perception. And uh, Finra picks the arbitrator pool from which uh, the customer and the broker dealer choose uh, the panel. So I mean, it's not shocking that there's that perception of unfairness. And I want to also underscore here before we go further that we're really, we're not running down, I don't want this to turn into running down arbitration at FINRA. I want to keep it to choice, but I still, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the survey, although I think you've done a good job pointing out that it's about perception, and perception is important. And then we'll let Bob, I, I, I want to let you right. continue, but then Bob would like to say a few words too. We don't have enough subject. time. <coughs> there, there are so many, well, so many. You know, I okay. think you made your great, it's well, a great point. It's let, perception, right, so but you, uh, you, is it perception important? Well, yes, perceptions are important. A couple of statements that I made. First, uh, a third of the arbitrators on each panel, in each case, are from the industry. Well, a third of the cases get decided by one arbitrator, a period, who's fr public, not, from, not af affiliated with the industry. So. Right off the bat, that's an issue. And of the other arbitrators, I've heard people say, well, there's an industry representative on the panel. Uh, I don't think so. The industry representative is a lawyer for the industry. The industry arbitrator does not represent the industry any more so than the public, the two majority, uh, the majority well, so of the George, panel. George, is he there wait, to be an expert? Let me no, finish. Okay, but is he right. there to be so, an expert? So, no, no. The expert is the expert hired by the firm to be an expert or by the claimant. So. That's one issue. Then I've heard this now three times. I was going to give you, you know, three. So third time's enough. Um, run by the industry, uh, the a forum, you know, run by the industry. I am. St I've been with Finra and ASD for 11 years. I'm waiting for that first check. Okay. i run by the industry. Let's see. Uh, you know, we're kind of a taxing authority. You know, we find you, the you firms. Like we find the firms. Uh, we throw people out of the industry. Um, it's true. We're funded by industry assessments. Uh, we, some, we, can, we work with the Justice Department to bring prosecutions. We help the SEC bring civil actions. But we are, we are funded by our constituents, kind of like you know, the IRS. So I guess the IRS also is the taxpayer advocacy, gr advocacy group uh, funded and controlled by the uh, public. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure you know, we're run by the industry. I, I don't quite buy that. Uh, and I, I guess the, the third thing about the pool, uh, the point you made about the pool, uh, pools of arbitrators, uh, the pools come from all over. People are nominated by people like Ted or people like Ted. Uh, law professors, they, they run the gamut and they are reviewed not by me or my staff but by a, a committee called the National Arbitration Mediation Committee. It is an oversight group. A majority of them are public. The chairman is always public. They tell us who gets on the roster. I don't get to decide that. And then last, the, who gets on cases? Well, in the good old days, you know, 12 years ago, our staff actually decided. They would say, look, here are your three arbitrators, and the parties had limited peremptory rights. That went away. And right now, there's a system where the a computer randomly selects lists of proposed arbitrators. The staff had their grubby hands off that process. That was what people perceived to be a problem, and we addressed it. So anyway, you know, just a, a few of the points we made. And, and lastly, uh, if we get to it, and I'm not going to get through the long list now, I think it comes, when people mention fairness, uh, I don't want any of the comments I made about choice, about you know, FINRA not having a horse in the race on mandatory to be misconstrued. Um, we believe our program is fair by any measure. We'll get into it before. And it's not a belief based on perception. I can demonstrate fact you know, that our program is fair. And when you read the preambles of the federal uh, the bills to ban arbitration in consumer uh, context, yeah, there's some horrible things that need to be addressed. That's not my program. Uh, our program is fair. We'll get into it a bit later. And I'll, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone on that issue. I mean, talk about mandatory, talk about an industry arbitrator, but fairness of this program is, is something I will defend to the core. Yeah. I, I'm uh, done. Just to be clear, uh, for me, fairness goes to the issue of uh, choice. But, Bob, I want to let you jump in, chomping at the bit there. Yeah, well, I, I was chomping. I'm not so sure I'm, I'm, I'm listening to everybody. Uh, it's... Uh, um, Interesting study results. To me, <coughs> I think it is perception. I think it's very easy to take an average person off the street who has a brokerage account and who has a dispute 
and ask that person, would you rather be in a courtroom with a judge sitting high, wearing a robe, having a gavel, and having the gravitas of, a, of the state with flags and everything else, or would you rather have three jokers in a room around a conference table asking questions in a not necessarily greatly organized way, trying to determine what facts are involved. What are you describing? Arbitration <laughs> in some context. And what I'm saying is that, is that uh, studies in this area, I think, are very hard to do with very reliable results. Ultimately, if we're talking about choice, I myself, I have no uh, uh, dog in the hunt or whatever it's called. Uh, I, fine, I think it's better for business, actually, <laughs> for jams. If you had court proceedings, we'd be flooded with more mediation work as people f feared what they perceive as the uncertainty with punitive damages and juries and class action and everything else in a courtroom. So uh, if business was the issue, I think I'd be, I'd be all in favor of choice. Uh, um, my own view, again, just from my personal life as, a, as a, a, a litigator, is that I have a very skeptical view about what the courts are capable of doing. And even with the consumer bills and all those uh, terrible things that uh, are obviously have to be addressed, I'm still uncertain whether or not throwing all these claims into a sewer service type system in a courtroom is going to make a consumer's life better uh, as opposed to tinkering with the arbitration system and making certain mandatory rules. You know, you have to have the hearing at the place of, uh, of where the event occurred, the, uh, the defendant has to be present. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to, to tinker with that system. But um, I, I still, after doing both now, I'm, I'm still uh, just personally uh, 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 in favor of what I think is going to be a fair result, and I'm not sure whether choice is necessarily that. Again, hard to argue with choice. Fine, exactly. you want choice? Go ahead, have, have well, choice. Let, let me and ask you this. And in five years, you have symposiums like this with people moaning and groaning about the choices that they were given and they chose poorly, I well, think. Well, does it, does it bother you or anybody else on the panel that uh, arbitrators, well, let's stick with uh, securities arbitration, FINRA arbitration. Arbitrators don't have to follow the law. They don't have to really write an opinion. It well, doesn't bother me at all. Okay. Um, uh, just so it's clear, if both sides want an opinion, they can have an opinion, but typically it's not the case. And that's really one of the benefits of arbitration. I mean, you but go the in, law isn't applied? You, get, you get rough justice. No, arbitrators apply the law. I mean, constantly you'll, you'll submit legal briefs, both sides will. The panel will ask for legal briefs if there's a complicated issue or a different type of issue. But what, what you see most of the time is it's not overly complicated, so they don't have to, to get briefed. I mean, did this broker defraud you? Well, by the time you finish the arbitration hearing, you've, you've, known, you've heard every single fact related to that account and that relationship and the, the relationship between the broker and the client and what went on in the account. And you have three people that are hearing all this. They've heard expert witnesses. It's not generally a legal issue. It's a, it's a factual issue. Did the broker do the right thing? Did he intentionally defraud the client? You can call the 33 Act, the 34 Act, the 40 Act. You know it when you see it, okay? I would like to just respond to the perception issue because sure. it's always been a problem. I've never, I, I've never ceased to be amazed since middle of the 80s. Um, I've been interviewed, I don't know how many times, I've read so many articles on arbitration. Every single one says the exact same thing. It doesn't matter whether arbitration could be the most fair process in the world. All you will ever read in the paper is people get screwed in arbitration as an industry representative, it's a stack deck, you don't have your right of appeal, blah, 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 okay? There's never a balanced presentation. The average person has read nothing but negative things about arbitration for 25 years. I'm surprised it's not 100% to think it's a bad process. But let's face it, we're here because as lawyers and as law students, you want to get past that old, you know, the perception is reality mantra, which I frankly find despicable. Um, I think we should get beyond that. 
Okay, if perception is reality, okay, let's just do what the perception is. Let's just, you know, blindly go along with whatever the masses think. Let's, let's try to get to the bottom of the issue, the heart of the matter, which is what is a better process for investors and brokers. And if you think it's court, let's go to court. If you think arbitration is a bad process for investors, forget choice. Do away with it completely. In 1987, the Supreme Court of the United States said that this is a great process for investors, that all their statutory rights will be vindicated. I would love for George to have two hours to tell you in the last 25 years, all the changes, the pro-investor changes, I think, that have been made in the process since that time. It's unbelievable, but you never, you'll never read anything about it anywhere. Um, the process is incredible. I mean, even the arbitrator selection process they have now, to me, is so much better than you know picking a jury, which in some places, the, the judge basically will do it for you. And you'll get people, they, they don't have a clue, okay? Let's face it, now you get a, a, a process that's, that's gone through, been vetted by public opinion. The SEC has, has signed off on it. You have three separate lists of eight people. Each side can strike up to four on that list, and then you rank the rest, and then it's a mixture of what the claimants rank and then what the de defendants rank. But look at all the information you have to make it an educated choice as a consumer. You can get from securities arbitration commentator, the editors in the back room there, Rick Ryder, you can get a summary of every award ever issued by every one of those panelists. So you can see exactly what all the claims were in every case they ever sat on, whether they were the chair, whether they were a member of the panel, what the amount of the claim was, what the amount of the award was, anything aberrational is written up in the summary. What, how, do you, how can you possibly have a more educated decision or a process to make a decision about who you're going to get? The only remaining issue then is, are the, is the arbitrator pool a good pool? And I can assure you, if you got 50 representatives of the securities industry in this room, they would tell you that they think the average arbitrator pool these days is stacked towards the investor side. So for me to, to, to hear that you know, it's a stacked de deck against investors, I almost have to laugh because you, sh you should hear what the industry is saying about it. They feel it's gone, the pendulum has gone completely the other way. The, the trend now is to get people that don't know anything because that's perceived to be fair. I personally always felt it's nice to have a little you know, a little knowledge, a little expertise on the panel, have people that have good judgment. They can be from all walks of life. They can be academics. They can be business people. They can be professors. They can be a compliance director at a broker firm, a competitor of the respondent. It's a good thing. You get balance. You get perspective. You have people that have sat in cases before. They know the difference between a good case and a bad case. Or you can have, you know, someone that you pick off the street. I don't know why you would assume that the latter is automatically better, I guess is my point. Well, I just want to say, uh, Apropos of your comment that the pendulum has swung the other way, I, I don't think FINRA's own statistics bear that out. I think, George, uh, the paper that you presented said, I think that the customer, quote unquote, wins maybe 56% of the time. And I think that was what, uh, 07 to 08 or 08 to 09. But that's not really the, 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 the relevant question. The question is, uh, what does a win constitute? Uh, do you get back 10% of the damages you're claiming, or do you get 90%? Um, I, so I disagree with what you're saying, Ted, that, uh, well, that the pendulum has swung, you know, uh, really favors uh, the claimants. I have to tell you that I think any time you measure the, the value of a system by the percentage of people that win is a fundamentally flawed system. Why would you assume that every case has merit? Yeah, why would, right why would you assume that people should win? If that's the case, why don't we just give everybody a check and we can save a lot of money? But, but on w one point on the stats, because there was a study done about six years ago now on the so-called win rate. And there, just for the students here, there are two different things we're talking about, we should be clear. One is just the percentage of time the customer gets something. We don't, I don't define that as a win, but people do. So. That's one stat, and that actually is around 45% of the time the customer gets something, which means I think around 55% they get nothing. That's clearly a loss, I think. I think. Um, then the other is when they win, when they get a recovery, what percent of the amount claimed, which uh, is a relatively meaningless statistic. Don't take my word for it. Seth Lipner, who used to be president of Piava, wrote an article pointing out why it's kind of a foolish stat. In fact, a year ago, uh, roughly a year ago, I, I would be able to sit here and say, you know, the average percentage recovery has been 99% in the first quarter. 99%. FINRA has its own stimulus package, 
Uh, now, the re well, the, of course, there was one award for $400 million, which was the amount claimed. That's kind of skewed it up, which is why that average is kind of unusual. Um, but, you know, number, n the, the point on the so-called uh, win rate, again, going back to the percentage of cases where the customers get something, let's look at the long picture. About 10 years ago, two-thirds of the cases got settled. Settled, two-thirds settled, and a, and a third got decided by arbitrators. Just keep that in mind. Roughly two-thirds settled, and a third got decided, whichever way, got decided by arbitrators. Well, the pie, the piece of the pie of cases set, decided by arbitrators has been shrinking. It went down to 20%, it's running about 25%. So you're looking, first of all, at a shrinking part of the pie. So as that's gone down, the part that's settled has gone up, about 75% now. Now, I got to think. It's we the first recently, wait, hasn't it? A little it's tiny amount. Tiny amount. So, um, I got to think when the customer is settling, we can have a show of hands here. If, the, if their attorneys recommend they settle, usually it's not for zero. I mean, usually they're settling for some kind of monetary amount. So, let me see. Three quarters of the time, the customer is getting something by way of settlement. Roughly half the time in the awarded cases, they're getting something. So, I think my program is returning money to investors at a fairly uh, prestigious rate. Some people may disagree with that, but just focusing on the cases that get decided, again, is, is misleading because that pie is getting smaller. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, so I don't know where to start, George. I'll start uh, McMahon. No, I, 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 no, we've covered <laughs> McMahon. We've covered McMahon. Frankly, and I haven't spoken for a while, you, you, you seem to be stepping back a little bit from the SECA study that our group actually helped create that that the NASD and the New York Stock Exchange, who were merged into FINRA um, just two or three years ago, um, they were involved in choosing who the authors were of the study. You contracted with the authors. You chose them. Sika. This th Sika, yes. On behalf of Sika. This no, was New York Stock Exchange the and the NASD, right? right? We signed it because SEEK is not a corporate. Right. You look, you, we all looked at the questions that were going to go out. We all passed on that. The questions were sent out. The responses came in. There were 3,000 responses. And, and the survey is of the participants. This is not the perception of the people who read the newspapers. I'm not disagreeing this is a with you. It's perception of the people who actually it's a study on, there. It's a survey on I agree. I agree with and you. And they say it's unfair. They said it was biased. I mean, it's a terrible thing. They perceive and, it. And, and you know... You used to be at the American, uh, uh, the, um, the, the American Arbitration Association in a similar capacity, and I used to argue for the right to go out of the industry and go to a firm like the uh, American Arbitration Association or JAMS. Then I agree with you. Called, yeah. the, called the Amex window. There was a little known provision in the American Stock Exchange Constitution, Article 8, which gave the customer the right, if they signed the pre-dispute arbitration clause, that says you can go to the American Stock Exchange, which said you could also choose to go to the American Arbitration Association. And so people were trying to get through that portal to go to the American Arbitration Association, like JAMS. The industry didn't want the customers to do that. The industry didn't want to get out of the SRO arbitration system because that's their home court. They have an advantage there. Everyone's been talking about how fair the system is, and I'm telling you, as a claimant's attorney for over 25 years, it is not fair in every single case. As a matter of fact, in over 50% of the cases, I'm with those participants who say it's unfair. I'm with those people who say the public pool isn't pure. There are people in the public pool who have industry ties. Get them out. Now, FINRA has tried to do that a bit, but they haven't succeeded. It is not like a judge and jury. That's all the investor wants the right to choose. Now, we talked about settlements. You think settlements are a good thing? You think if the arbitration awards, which were on such a sliding scale, from the first GAO report, which was issued in 1992, looking at arbitration awards in 1989 and 1990, which showed these win rates were 60% for the investors, and the recovery rates were about 61%. Okay, now think about that for a second. That's right after the McMahon case. 
Do you know where they are today? They're in the toilet. Take a look at the statistics that we wrote about in our article. Take a look at my testimony before Congress in the Arbitration Fairness Act of 2007. It's online, you can find it at our website, epensteinlaw.com. You will see how bad the statistics are. You will see the downward spiral of arbitration awards from 99, 2000, into 2002, and then boom, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, down to a win rate at the NASD, according to their own statistics, of 42%. And when you take a look at the recovery rates, they also went down. And there's a third factor, and that's something that's known as the expected recovery percentage, which factors in the recovery rates with the percentage of the award claim, and that's called an expected recovery percentage. And there are two authors who did a study, which was published in 2007. They looked at 14,000 arbitration awards, and it's not because the NASD and the New York Stock Exchange gave them the awards, because they refused to do it. They had to go and get those awards on their own. And you know what that study showed? That study showed that the expected recovery rate in 1998, in 1998, was 38%. And in 2004, which was the last year that they looked at awards, the expected recovery rate was 22%. Now, settlements, settlements are terrible. Settlements reflect the low awards that customers can expect if they take their case to finality in the arbitration system. That's what, that's what settlements are. And to hear that, well, the customer is getting something because they settle a lot of cases, it's only because they don't want to go to the final decision, because they're scared that they're going to get zero. Take a look at Gretchen Morganson. She's a reporter for the New York Times. She wrote an article called how winning is a lot like losing. December 10, 2006, I believe. Look at her story. Look at her story to the SEC in 2007 to fix arbitration now because it's so bad. Take a look at the letter that all of the public members wrote to FINRA in January 2007 saying, give back to the investor the right to go to court. Fix your arbitration system. Get rid of the mandatory arbitrator, the mandatory industry arbitrator. And how good is it? How do you think customers or attorneys like us feel if there's an administrative appointment in an arbitration case where we don't have a peremptory challenge and who gets appointed? Well, one of our former adversaries gets appointed. Now, how fair is that? All right. I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of you will want to respond to some of the things that Ted Epstein said. But I think at this point, I want to start including the audience and uh, fielding some questions. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple roving mics here. And uh, who wants to ask a... Uh, question, make a statement, um, anybody? I'll break the ice if no one else does. I have a question for Mr. Friedman. How do you think the um, uh, Arbitration Fairness Act of 2009 is going to affect securities arbitration as a, as a consumer, as a consumer uh, product? Well, it depends on whether it's enacted, I think. <laughs> but, well, let's just uh, say hypothetically it does get enacted. Well, you're raising an interesting question. I guess we had a baseline what we're talking about here. We promised to do that. Uh, there, there are a couple of bills pe pending in Congress, one in the House, one in the Senate, called the Arbitration Fairness Act, now of 2009. And among other things, it would basically say uh, outlaw mandatory pre-dispute ag agreements and consumer franchise employment and something else. Labor. Labor. Uh, and there was some question about whether consumer meant uh, also included customer broker agreements, and at least the House version says, yeah, it does. 
So let's assume that became the law. Um, it, it, the answer to your question kind of depends what happens with the, uh, the financial reform legislation because if it passes in current form, it, that would give the commission, the SEC, the authority to limit, ban, modify, or otherwise regulate pre-dispute agreements if it decides that it's in the uh, interest of the, in the investing public to do so. So sooner or later, those two have to be reconciled, I think, because you have one statute that says we're going to reserve, if it becomes law, reserve to the SEC to take a look at this and decide what to do, and another saying, um, you know, let's outlaw a mandatory pre-dispute agreements in the consumer realm. So if they both become law, you've got a conflict, clearly, and I, I think probably they would be, that would be reconciled beforehand. But, you know, the law, it's an inter interesting point you raise, the law of unintended consequences. Uh, let's just stay with the Arbitration Fairness Acts. As written, they would require all parties to agree after the dispute arises to arbitrate, all parties. So that would mean the industry would have to agree as well. So if a dispute arises and the customer says, well, yeah, I'd like to arbitrate, the firm could say, yeah, I don't think so, not this time. Uh, now, I mentioned before a rule that we have, FINRA has, that says if the customer wants to arbitrate, if the investor wants to arbitrate, the firm has to. Uh, we would not abandon that rule. Our chairman, Rick Ketchum, has made that really clear. But I'm not sure what's going to happen uh, ultimately with the efficacy of that rule. Already the industry is, is making noises about, well, you know, if it's truly voluntary, then FINRA's rule should go away, this rule that allows investors to make, uh, require arbitration. Uh, I agree with Ted, this one. I, I think that would be a bad thing. That would be, a, I, I think investors, if that were to happen and, and investor, investors lost the opportunity to choose arbitration, that would be bad. And uh, so it uh, remains to be seen, but clearly Congress, I think, would have to reconcile if both uh, become the law, would have to reconcile that obvious conflict. Thank you. Anybody else? Mike over here. This whole thing is kind of fascinating for me because I'm kind of an insider on it because I work at one of the brokerages and I actually um, work in the early dispute resolution group. So we're not in, we don't, I don't actually do the arbitration, I'm not one of the litigators, but I take the complaint and, and do a pretty thorough review. And then we decide if we're going to deny it, at which point you can keep writing back to us, you know, or go on to mediation, or if we're going to settle it. You know, so I kind of have the, I don't know, inside opinion on it. Um, what I can tell you is, you know, there is an onslaught of complaints. It's starting to slow down now. Um, but we are so heavily regulated that for a long period of time, pretty much all I did every day was respond to FINRA because any time something goes on a broker's record, we know that a couple of months later they're going to be following up with us saying, how did you handle this? And one of these inquiries can be, and I'm sure George knows, 16, 17 questions documents and show us every complaint against the broker for the preceding three years. We want every detail of it. So we're kind of a little bit shaking in our boots because there is so much oversight. Um, as far as settlements are concerned, really the clients, many of whom are elderly, just want whatever will be fastest. Um, that being said, when we come to a point where there's an impasse, they seem to be happy that they can go to the FINRA website and that there is a little bit of guidance of what do I do now. You know, I turn to you guys and you're saying, I, 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 you know, you don't really think we have a case. Um, I do encourage them to go to the FINRA website, that that is their right, and they seem to be appreciative that they're not just, okay, go hire a lawyer for a few thousand dollars, that there, there's a lot of literature out there, um, you know, the path is kind of paved for them. That's just been my experience doing this for a year. So yeah. how, how long has your broker-dealer had this, uh, this uh, department that uh, fields customer complaints uh, before customers make a formal filing with FINRA? Um, we've, well, first of all, I work for Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. So we've had some version of it for quite a very long time, um, but they really honed it in, I'd say, probably the last eight years. I mean, don't, don't quote me on that, but it just seems like it's a really effective um, policy. I mean, I'm, I'm from the Smith Barney side, and Morgan Stanley is now joint ventured in with us, or maybe vice versa. So they have a similar program, and it just seems to, you know, work really well. And as, again, as, as Mr. Friedman was saying, 
um, the number that's going to arbitration is getting smaller because we're settling, you know, so so much of this because the economic downturn. Sure, more people were complaining just because they lost money, just because they had, you know, lost money. But again, you know, it can be argued, as I was saying to the gentleman earlier, that the the worse the market gets, the more creative, you know, brokers can get, and, and sometimes there legitimately are big settlements that we have to pay out. I mean, I personally settled a $70,000 case last week. Um, so we do it every single day. Was that the amount that was uh, claimed or that's what you ultimately settled for? That was actually the amount claimed. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday I filed another $17,000 settlement, which was actually the amount claimed. Because again, we're, we're kind of shaking in our boots a little bit that you know, we can just deny it and hope that it goes away, but we have this massive oversight that's not going to go away. And we have had issues where we have a regulatory inquiry and FINRA or the SEC or a state regulator just keeps coming back and saying, one more question and we don't agree with you and what are you going to do about this? So I don't know if we feel like the, you know, the decks are stacked for us. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no question that it's a highly regulated mm -hmm. uh, field. No question at all about that. Right. Anybody well, not all the time, Karen. As Pardon? a matter of fact, if we're talking about Morgan Stanley, and I hate to bring this up, but they had a... <laughs> that's, well, I know, but it's now Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. Um, and and I, you know, I, I must be talking to the wrong attorneys when I file my case because... Do you have a uh, card? I haven't seen a, uh, a settlement yet. Uh, but moreover, um, they got into a little difficulty um, a year or two ago uh, because they didn't turn over emails in a whole slew of arbitration cases. And, and those cases went to award, and some of the claimants lost in those cases. And, and there was a whole lawsuit against them, and, and the NASD, I believe at the time, uh, brought an action and settled it uh, with Morgan Stanley. Um, so it's a very hard process to go through when you get to the arbitration area. And frankly, it's a very hard process to go through when you try to resolve cases. Uh, I'm glad, though, that, um, that your, your area is uh, stepping up to the plate and settling. Karen, would it be helpful if I talk about how the public arbitrator pilot is going uh, sure, but let me get a couple questions in, if you don't mind, sir. I actually had a question for Professor Fanto. Um, seeing as how you were able to hear <laughs> these arguments so many years ago, and now hearing what you have tonight, do you still feel, feel the same way? Yeah. Can I have a mic? <laughs> it feels like not on the panel if you have the night off. W wasn't my opinion. I mean, I was just working for someone um, who happened to write a dissent. So, you know, I think that and, but his view, you know, way back when was, um, well, you know, Blackman was kind of a populist. He was a financial, you know, he's a, he's a sophisticated guy, but, you know, it lived through the Depression and everything. It was very had probably a gut suspicion of the securities industry without being, you know, some crackpot or whatever. And his feeling was, you know, that this old kind, old, old time populist view, which was that that the investor ultimately need, you know, if you needed to stack the deck in favor of the investor, you had to go out of your way to make sure. So if you were, if you had a close case, it should go in the investor's side, because the investor was always likely to be hurt by Wall Street, <laughs> and you know that was just his feeling. Now, uh, his other concern was that that the people on the court at the time were very hostile to Section 10 d you know, which was an implied of action, and that this was just another way to, if, you know, if you, if you follow 10 b students, you know, throughout the 70s and 80s, there's just ways to whittle it down. So his concern was, well, this was taking, this was a way to take 10 B jurisprudence out of the courts and throw it to arbitration, and that would undermine it. And there are people on the court at the time who thought, well, yeah, we can do that. 
Because after all, it's just an implied right of action. Somehow the court got into it. They never should have. So let's throw it, throw it out. Now, arguably, there were people on the court who thought well of arbitration and you know followed the development and the jurisprudence. And there was the Federal Arbitration Act. And you know they, they were kind of just recognizing what had happened. You know since uh, Wilco. So you know, but I guess what. But, you know, I, I, I started thinking about just that jurisprudence point. I mean, the one thing that, that, that worried me in some ways is that you know, when you throw everything to arbitration, after a while, you kind of lose the development of the case law, and, well, you know, which case law can be useful in guiding people, guiding conduct, having people think about when you, you know, applying to law, the law to new situations. I worry about that sometimes in the, in the 10 d area. You know, I mean, if you see after those decisions, and suddenly there's just all these, you know, the case law just goes away because now we're in the United States. I mean, you can say the benefits of arbitration. I'll weigh, I'll weigh that law to the case law. You know, and, but, you know, the case law does guide us and think through these another question in the back there. Yeah? I wanted to say that as an industry arbitrator, I feel that my integrity has been impugned tonight. Not only do we take an oath as an arbitrator, but I can assure you that I and the other industry arbitrators that I meet approach each case with an open mind. I'm not an industry representative. I'm an arbitrator with industry background, and I've certainly met public arbitrators who approach cases with prejudice, not unique to industry arbitrators who may exist with prejudice. I also wonder if the study that you cited was broken down according to winners and losers of arbitration, because I would think that could color your perception. And lastly, I'd like to mention that I went to my dentist last week, and I was given an arbitration agreement to sign. So business may be on the rise. That's good ever do. All right. Okay. Uh, what about the possibilities of the SEC just taking over the entire arbitration system and having it funded by these massive fines they've imposed on the industry. What about it? Well, having a system where they... Uh, no, I... I a public no, options, so I don't speak. think anyone has proposed that, and the commission is... Have, is and I, I surely don't speak for the commission, but the commission has its own issues about staffing on the regulatory and enforcement side, and so my personal view is I, I don't see funds being diverted to set up a, an arbitration system when, in fact, <coughs> the trend has been to delegate authority to organizations like FINRA. Well, well uh, Karen, can I respond to that? Uh, Anthony, there was um, actually a proposal um, uh, that we made before Congress, uh, and it had to do with the benefit to, um, to the broker-dealers, uh, which was made by FINRA because of the savings uh, from the merger of the uh, New York Stock Exchange and the, and the um, NASD into FINRA. And if you remember, um, the almost 5,000 members uh, of the, uh, the broker-dealership uh, each received $35,000 <coughs> as part of the cost saving because of the merger of the arbitration and enforcement divisions. Um, well, my math shows that that comes up to $175 million that were paid to the industry parties in arbitrations. And yet nothing was given to the public customer or on the public customer's behalf. So we recommended that FINRA should take a portion of 
the cost savings uh, and develop an entirely new arbitration system outside of the industry uh, with new rules and regulations which would not require someone from the industry to sit in on every case, but only by agreement of the parties, and require some other changes to the arbitration system. Now, in FINRA's defense, it seems that ever since Congress got involved in this area in a big way, which is 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, FINRA has proposed different changes to their arbitration system, which actually is investor friendly. And one is the public arbitrator pilot program that uh, George wants to tell you about, uh, which is a really good thing for investors. And I think it's a fair thing for the industry. Uh, however, it's not required for every broker dealer to join. So there's only a small portion of them who do. And then there's a limited number of cases that they've signed on for. And then if you decide that you're going to bring a claim as a customer against a, a registered individual in addition to the firm, you can't participate in the program. So all of those things have to be changed, and then I think it would work really well. Is that my cue? Um, well, if you want to, I want to capture some questions here. So, but I, I okay, do then they're going to go away not knowing what we're talking but, about. No, That's no, but okay, I do. Karen. I do want you to tell us. <coughs> excuse me. Tell us about uh, this like um, arbitrator um, option to choose an all public panel that uh, is uh, it's in his second year now, and it uh, finishes up what October two thousand and ten. Right, we're uh, three quarters of the way through. It, it's a pilot. Finra does pilots basically to test concepts. Sometimes it's a good idea. Uh, initial pre hearing conference r rule, for example, was a pilot, and we enacted. It. Sometimes it's a bad idea. Um, the, there was ten years ago. There was a pilot to let people choose AAA or JAM, something personal. Um, I, I spent twenty two years at AAA. I mean, but. Um, and most investors didn't want to do that, so it wasn't such a good idea. And then sometimes we tweak it. So anyway, we're doing a pilot. We have more pilots than United, frankly, at, at FINRA. <laughs> uh, and it's a two-year pilot. It's going to end in October. And you're right. It's, it's it started with 11 firms, and there are 14 participating firms. We're evaluating the concept. It's going to end, and there will be an evaluation. In fact, the evaluation is ongoing. We're not waiting for the end to do the evaluation. So I can tell you now, uh, given a chance to opt in, investors given a chance to opt in to the pilot, I said, well, they're all going to opt in. Wrong. 56% uh, of the time they opt in, 44% not. And then given a choice, uh, the way the pilot works, we don't have time for a lo long discussion, but the, you get to strike all of the industry arbitrators. I think Ted or Ted mentioned typically you get to strike four names on a list. Now, the way the pilot works, you can strike them all. So if you don't like who you see on the list, you go like this. And then we appoint the public arbitrator to fill that slot. So how often did the investor rank industry arbitrators? 54% uh, of the time, they're leaving industry arbitrators. So it's telling us things. It's telling us choice is a good thing. I agree. But we will evaluate it pretty quickly after it ends and then decide what to do. And in the past, either we adopt a rule, we decide it was a bad idea, or we tweak it. And that's clearly one of those th three things is going to happen. Uh, in the meantime, since the rulemaking process takes a while, we're already having discussions with the participating firms to keep it going on a voluntary basis for another year, and I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do that. I think it's a, it's a terrific uh, program, but I did have one question. Those, uh, those customers that didn't opt in, uh, did, was there a question uh, yes. as to whether or not their attorneys knew about the program? Yes. Knew that they could opt in? So did, did you test that? Yes. We do. Sur you know, we also do lots of surveys. And so pe people decline. We said, you know, why? Why, why did you uh, decline? Uh, by, by the way, we notice sometimes cases are opting in before we even serve it. It's filed and the, and the customer's attorney says, look, I want in. You don't have to ask me. Um, but if not, we send a letter. It's on different colored paper. We do follow up. So they know. Uh, the question, the survey, in the beginning I think it may have been an issue because the success rate, the participation rate has steadily gone up. It was around 51% the, right, the first year. Second year it's running like 64%, so you blend those together, it's like 55 I said before. But 
uh, we did surveys and we said, why, you know, why didn't you go in? And some of the answers were interesting. interesting. Sometimes it was, well, you know, I wanted an industry arbitrator and I didn't want to take a chance that all of the names would be stricken. About half the time, that was the answer. Uh, uh, other, other times, it was, well, I wanted to see, uh, I didn't want to give my opponent the ability to dictate what kind of panel I get, because both sides get to strike up to all eight names. Uh, so, interesting answers. I was totally wrong on all my bets. I was buying lunches for weeks uh, to people. I was totally wrong on participation and how often the investor would strike all the names. But we're going to learn things. Um, I know you're dying for me to say, well, how, how are they coming out? And what are the decisions? Uh, there have been 11 so far. And they're just, and you, by the way, you said something about, you know, we wouldn't give them the awards. FINRA.org, that's our web address. They're all there for free. Uh, all of our awards are, are there. And we made it really easy to find these uh, awards, a little drop-down box. So it's too early to tell. My prediction, my personal view, is that there will be no statistical difference in the outcomes. When we get more than 11 awards, when we get enough awards where people say, all right, that's enough to draw conclusions, I don't think there's going to be any difference. But again, it's about perceptions. And if that perception, if anything, will help the industry understand that there's no danger in having an all-public panel. OK. We had a question back Just a, a quick question for Ted Epstein. Uh, Ted, if you did have choice now, you could go to court or you could go to arbitration. I'm curious if you would take any cases to arbitration, and if so, what kinds of cases would you take? Sure. Uh, I'd take good cases with under $200,000 at issue. To arbitration? To arbitration. And why would you do that? Uh, because it's, I think the cost issue comes into play at that point. I think that's sort of the break point. Um, I think arbitration uh, should be there for investors because uh, of the smaller size claims, especially if it's under $100,000. Um, it just doesn't, it, you, you can hardly get an attorney today to take one of those cases, especially on a contingency basis uh, because of the low expectancy that you're going to win and the low recovery that you, that you can expect. So, um, so that's why you really want to go to court uh, unless the expenses are such that, that you would recommend taking your chances in arbitration. And if you had to guesstimate, what percentage of your cases then that you currently have do you think you would end up bringing to arbitration under those guidelines? Zero. You don't have any? Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any other questions? OK, well, thank, I want to thank everybody for coming here. And I want to thank this fantastic uh, panel. <laughs> <laughs>